Hello vinyl community and others. My name is Brian. This video will be my favorite records from 1980. I've already done my favorite records from 1989, which I started with oddly, and then 1979, so totally out of sequence. But I have made lists for most years. It's just that I hadn't finalized some of them. So I figured I was going to get this is as good as it's going to get in terms of ranking these because it's sometimes difficult to figure out which order they go in. So in making this list, I made a list of top my top 50 records that I own from 1980 and narrowed it down to bizarrely the top 11 <laughs> so uh yeah I, and one thing that always occurs to me in these lists is are these are these records my favorite records from the time like the, when I was living in the year 1980 or are these favorite records from years later and I think by and large these are records that I knew about if not in 1980 within no more than a decade probably after that so not exactly 1980 but but close enough so I will it down to 11, and without giving too much um, preamble, I will start with a oddball, quirky Canadian band that was very popular in the Queen Street West region in Toronto, which was an area with lots of clubs and, and, and new music happening. <clears throat> and I think some people might know this. If you're, if you're in Toronto, you might know this. And that is a band called The Government, and this is the record called Guest List. This is the band's second record. Before this, they released a single called Hemingway Hated Disco Music, which is the only piece of vinyl that I'm missing from this band. It's hard to find. It's kind of expensive. They released uh, their debut record the year before called Electric Eye, which is really almost a soundtrack to a video performance. That's something that's interesting about this band. There's often video involved with their performances. The Andrew Patterson, uh, the, the main writer here, worked with something called Video Cabaret. He's an artist, um, a writer, a musician, so video was one of his interests. He's still working in art in Toronto. Um, Robert Stewart unfortunately passed away. So this is the second record. There is also a 7-inch 33 and a third RPM EP with four tracks, which is kind of a curious record. There's a song on there called Flat Tire, which is a euphemism for an inability to, to perform and then there's a 12 inch single that came out after this so I have all those except for the first single so this is a really wacky record uh, I think some people missed the point of this I read a review that um, was kind of scathing but and there isn't really much about this band on the internet but I think this record is, is funnier than people give it credit for um, like a cute angle it's a minute and 38 seconds pretty funny complications which has a lot of profanities actually got is pretty funny there's just a lot of really I think quirky avant-garde bizarro things on here on the fringes of maybe not new wave maybe not punk but somewhere in that range here we have the some images uh, so kind of unusual this record is not necessarily hard to find i see it from time to time in record stores but uh it's kind of unknown oddly though in my <laughs> here i'm three minutes in still talking about one record in my undergrad residence, this was a really popular record. It got played all the time, even though it had come out years before we were actually there. So that is the weird one. And let's go to the top 10 now for another Canadian band. This band is from Hamilton, Ontario, which is just around the corner from us. Hamilton, known as Steel Town because of the industry that's there. It's always been a steel producing town. And Hamilton is sometimes simply called The Hammer, which is pretty cool. This is a band called Teenage Head. I might have showed this record in the past. They played my high school, and I saw them there. Uh, they also are, I, I almost said responsible, but they were present for two riots in Toronto. The first happened at a show they played at the Horseshoe Tavern, also on Queen Street West. And another riot that happened at Ontario Place, because um, I think at the time that had a general admission thing. If you if you got into Ontario Place, you could go to the concert for free. And I think too many people showed up and the riot ensued. <laughs> so Ontario Place uh, banned rock concerts for years after because of this, because of this, uh, this band. <laughs> so, so there's some tragedy around this band, though. Frankie Venom, the lead singer there in the tie, died in 2008 from throat cancer. Um, <clears throat> so that's a, that's sad. The band he had left and come back from the band, but they were back and reformed, and he and he died. And Gord Lewis, also pictured here, the guitarist, was murdered in late 2022. And bizarrely, his son has been charged with uh, second degree murder. So that's so tragic. The band's continuing with the new, um, well, new singer and 
it's the singer they had for for a while and a new guitarist but kind of tragedy the other weird thing about this band is that they were on the verge of having a major american breakthrough and uh, first thing that happened is the record company the u.s record company made them change their name so they became known as teenage heads plural on the tornado record i guess because they thought this was too salacious and the other thing that happened was there was a car accident and Gord Lewis was injured and so they couldn't tour. So the breakthrough never really happened. It's kind of unfortunate because they were on the cusp of of a breakthrough, I guess. So a really good punk band. Um, big tracks on this would be Wild One, something else. Brand new Cadillac cover version, obviously. Um, yeah, it's a really solid record. One of my favorite Teenage Head records. All right. Number nine is a record I think everyone knows. I don't have to tell you much about it. ACDC's Back in Black, the record they recorded after the death of Bon Scott, which I think was a, a tremendous achievement. It's my favorite ACDC record. It's their seventh record. It was massively successful, obviously. Reinvigorated interest in hard rock. Uh, probably the biggest selling, one of the biggest selling hard rock records of all time. Um, yeah, and I think this is really really good um, and this one I did remember buying when it came out I don't know what month it came out um, but I remember picking it up I think it's a quality record I don't even have to tell you what's on here because you already know that and they're from Australia number eight most of my records are Canadian pressings but this one is a West German pressing so this is uh, the cure 17 seconds uh, their second record uh, this, I guess the big track on here is A Forest and Play for Today. Now, this is the or early origins of goth rock. I think someone referred to this as Gloomscapes, <laughs> which is kind of funny. Of course, it says Robert Smith, Matthew Hartley, Lawrence Tolhurst, and Simon Gallup. And um, this is, if, you're, if you only know later Cure, like, you know, Disintegration and um, Head on the Door, you might be surprised by this because it's a little... Mel I don't know if mellow is the right word, but not as um, upbeat, perhaps. Um, so a little bit of a different sound. I do prefer the sound. The, the early cure up until pornography, I think, is a really interesting sound. And then, of course, they slowly change into more upbeat, kind of danceable things in some respects. Not always, I mean, um, but that sort of change they had in the 80s. So I, I really um, like that record a lot. Let's see what else we have here. Okay. So this is a post-punk band, which was mentioned on P Harris Pilton's top 10 of 1980. And it's the only time I've ever seen anyone talk about this record, and that is the Durruti Column, Return of the Durruti Column. I used to think this was pronounced Durruti, but I think it's Durruti. So that's a direct reference to the Spanish Civil War, the Durruti Column being a force or a column, fifth column maybe, uh, that fought on the Republican side against Franco, Franco's army. Vin Riley, of course, the guitarist, produced by Martin Hannett, um, who you might know from a lot of factory productions. This is a very um, atmospheric record, though. If it's not, you know, post-punk is definitely correct, but um, it's in a polyline sleeve. Uh, by the way, the first pressing of this uh, had sandpaper on both sides and this one we didn't get in Canada until 1981 but it was released in 1980 and the original one in UK had sandpaper on either side uh, but this is a different sleeve so atmospheric mellow in a way if you want to get a good sense of what this band uh, sounds like just listen to sketch for summer which is the first song on side one and that'll kind of give you a sense of what's going on here I really love this record it's maybe a good record for Sunday mornings or late evenings, um, peaceful, quiet, introspective, um, a really good record. And uh, I have other ma records from them, but I don't see them talked about very often for whatever reason. Okay, so let's go on here to number sixth. Sixth, number six. So this is my choice for number six is the Ramones' End of the Century. Uh, here's a weird thing. If I were, t if you were to ask me what is my favorite Ramones record, I would probably choose this one. I know that's completely wacky because it doesn't really make sense, but this for me is the last great Ramones record. But also, because it was the first Ramones record I owned and the first record I played, I heard straight through from start to finish. It kind of stuck with me. And you know, it's. Do you remember rock and roll radio? You know, it's 
just really appealed to me. Produced by Phil Spector, which is a bit strange for them because they always did the re records very quickly in the studio and he had other production ideas, you know, his wall of sound. So it took longer, it cost more money, and uh, I think from what I've read, they weren't entirely happy with that. <clears throat> this one has the punch hole for the overstock remainder. So I don't know exactly when I got this, but this is as about as minty as you can get because here's a weird thing that I probably have never mentioned. Back in the day, I would often buy a record and I would make a tape, a cassette recording of it, and only play the cassette. So this record has been played really infrequently because for years, for many of my records, I only ever played, I had a massive amount of cassettes. I would just play the cassette. And of course, I could take them in the car later on. So um, that's a weird thing. So this record is pretty minty. Lyrics. And an image. So yeah, I, I really think this is a great record and maybe not the most, uh, many people probably wouldn't choose this as their favorite Ramones record, but I, I really like it. By the way, I mean, you, there's a, the lyric in here, do you remember lying in bed with the covers pulled up over your head, radio playing so no one could hear it? That was me at the time because that's what I would do. I was supposed to be sleeping, but instead I was listening to the radio, sometimes with headphones on, because um, the radio after all was the only place you could hear music years ago. Okay, number five. Again, this is a record I've seen on many top ten lists from 1980, and it, it kind of has to be there. It's Talking Heads, Remain in Light, has a lot of African-type rhythms, funky electronic sounds. Notably, Brian Eno is on this record, and also Adrian Ballou, one of my favorite guitarists, is on this record. Uh, the big track on here, of course, is Once in a Lifetime, but... You know, that's, you know, The Great Curve, Born Under Punches, Cross-Eyed and Pains. These are all great, great tracks. I really love this record. Probably my favorite Talking Heads record, maybe. Yeah, maybe it is. Um, yeah, Oddly, there's a credit to Robert Palmer on this record, too, as being one of the people who arranged or composed percussion, along with Brian Eno and others, but his name is listed there, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, the, the lyric sheet, the printed inner sleeve, there's the record on Sire, the polyline sleeve, so that, this is a really enjoyable record, um, okay, I don't know what else to say, but I think it's fantastic. Right, that was number five. Number four, this is a record also shown by Paris Hilton in his top ten, and that is the only time I have ever seen anyone show this record. I don't think it's very well known, but a friend of mine refers to this record as, and I'll quote, the greatest record ever made. I'm not sure I'd go that far, but I think it's really wonderful. It's uh, Young Marble Giants, Colossal Youth, which came out in February of that year. Just a trio of Allison Staten on voice, Philip Moxham on bass, Stuart Moxham, guitar and organ. So you'd also say this is a post-punk post record, but, you know, it's not very uh, aggressive music. It's very m minimal in a way. They only released this record in two EPs and there was a Peel session. You can get a later pressing of this which includes the EPs. I I don't have that. Um, they're from Welsh, from Cardiff as I recall. Um, really interesting. Like um, I wrote a quote down here. So I, uh, One of the most highly re regarded indie cult post-punk recordings with a unique with a unique hushed and minimal atmosphere. You don't have to take my word for it. Um, this is one of Kurt Cobain's, was one of his favorite bands. And Courtney Love's band Hole recorded a cover version of one of the tracks in here, which is called Credit in the Straight World, which you may have heard. It's actually a pretty good version. So Young Marble Giants. I kind of wish they had done more music, but this is, I should track down the EPs at some point. I just don't have them. So really excellent. Um, there was a, I think they re reformed at one point for some shows, but never recorded any new music. But truly an interesting excellent record. Where am I now? Number three. This is also a West German pressing and it's the debut record from Bauhaus. It's called In the Flat Field. Let me just show you what's in here. Virgin labels, red and green, and then the inner sleeve. Yeah, I mean, this is maybe, again, one of the earlier goth records if I were to choose my favorite Bauhaus record, it might be Mask, but I mean, this is great. It starts with Double Dare, In the Flat Field, God in an Alcove. I mean, there's so many great tracks on here. 
one uh, I remember one <laughs> recently reading that one reviewer referred to this as um, what was it a hip black Sabbath which I think is pretty weird now I will read a couple things because I'm always fascinated by by records that are slammed by critics and then later thought to be better like I think of Lou Reed's Berlin everyone hated that record but now of course uh, it's considered to be a classic but <laughs> someone wrote nine meaningless moans and flails bereft of even the most cursory contour of interest a record which deserves all the damning adjectives usually labeled that grim face modernists whatever that means um, someone said no songs just tracks ugh too priggish and conceited sluggish indulgence instead of hoped for gothness coldly catatonic now i i I think that's kind of bizarre because I think this is a, a really good record. Maybe it, maybe the sound of it was confused people at the beginning because it just seemed a little different, but I think that's a great record. All right, number two. Now, <clears throat> I considered putting this at number one, but when I thought about it, number one had to be what it is. But this one has been a long favorite for me in the early days maybe a bit of an underground classic and that is uh killing joke the debut record uh, from late 1980 this is a heavy heavy piece of music like it is post-punk i don't think you could say new wave you could say post-punk proto-industrial maybe even industrial metal it's it's got uh i think some people have said that this is the this is how or open the gates for people like Metallica and Nine Inch Nails. In fact, Metallica covered the track, "The Weight" on their 598 EP. So, I mean, this is a for me a game changing record. It just sounds so. If you want to know what it sounds like, if you don't know it, just listen to Requiem and War Dance, the first two tracks on um, on YouTube. If you can find them, a really really great record, um, led by Jazz Coleman. So. For a while, this may have been my favorite record. I considered it at number one, but um, but it's fantastic. Heavy though, and you know I like most things that Killing Joke have done. Some better than others. So for number one, I mean, you know, I, I said the Killing Joke could have been number one, but I, this really had to have been number one. It's always been a favorite from that year, and that's Joy Division closer the second lp now, of course there is one that comes out after this which collects some remainders and has a live record in it as well so they really only did two records uh by the way i've heard an interview with um peter hook and he definitely pronounces this as closer not closer but closer love the album cover really great minimal design beautiful black and white photograph this is an original Canadian pressing, but from 1981, not 1980. Factory Records product, and inside we have it's factory labels, and the inner sleeve, which lists the tracks on both sides. Trust of the Exhibition, Isolation, Passover Colony, 24. It's fantastic from start to finish. This is a really, uh, really fantastic record. I think Unknown Pleasures may be better, perhaps but this is really great. I made the mistake of buying Unknown Pleasures on cassette when I was in a record store sometime in the 80s. All my friends were buying cassettes, so I put the record back and bought a cassette. I later changed that, but um, this one I've had for quite a while, and it's in beautiful shape. And it's my favorite record from 1980. So I'm interested in... T I've seen many of these 1980 ones, and I, uh, I think I saw... Let's see. Um, Steve Carlson did it. Uh, Jason Skills, I believe, did it. Harris Pilton. Um, did I say Vinyl Ritchie? So I'm curious if what you think, um, if I've missed something out. Uh, as I say, your favorite record is probably number 12. But uh, thanks, once again, uh, thanks once again for watching. I'll talk to you next time.